Uh, greetings and welcome to another Bible study on this channel. Uh, currently, I am going with the name uh, Bible Basics. I think that's what I'm going with. If someone has a better idea, you know, maybe I'll change it. But for now, I think I'll go with Bible Basics. That sounds the best. Um, I went with Bible Study 101 initially, but then I checked, and apparently someone already took that name, so said it. I had to change it. So we're going with Bible Basics. Uh, now this uh, sermon, this was actually originally a sermon, is on Solomon. So I'm, I'm going a very different direction now. So uh, this is literally a sermon. Uh, so uh, a little less uh, theology, but still very, very practical. I think this is, uh, you know, Solomon is a very interesting character. So this is a uh, biographical sermon on Solomon. So I, I titled it Solomon the Apostate Man. So apostate, as in like uh, backslidden. Actually, you know what? Let me let, let me let's define that. Now let's let's Google apostate. You know, it's it's not a word that's used very often. Yeah, it's it's just not used very often. Uh, apostate, one who commits apostasy. Yeah, uh, some of these definitions. A defector, deserter. Uh, oh no, those are all synonyms. Um, let's see, synonym, synonyms, and evidence. Okay. Defector, deserter, recreant, renegade. Yeah, basically, it's like someone that goes back. Like you're going back. You're not. You're not sticking to your your former beliefs. And apostasy, or uh, is the condition that a lot of American churches are in right now. Uh, some realize it, some don't. Uh, but yeah, there is there's a lot of apostasy. Um, initially, it was just like, oh, it's just the liberal churches, right? Now, no, nah, now it's like it, it, even the Baptists. I would say a lot of them are in apostasy. Uh, so apostasy is a uh, is a, it's a disease that spreads, uh, you know, cowardice and just going backwards into you know going back and trying to blend in with the world. And that's really the condition of the the church today, especially in America. Uh, other countries where maybe Christians get persecuted, that's probably not the case. But in America, in America, it, that's, that's definitely the case. Um, so this this sermon is actually a very good sermon that just kind of uh, details the the condition of uh, the American Christian right now. Solomon is a very good type of um, uh, of, of the American Christian. If you just look at the like his life, just kind of how it's laid out. It really does follow the layout of a Christian that started right, maybe meant well, and just completely went downhill, like completely became worthless to God. Okay, so we're back. Um, yeah, so there's just a Christian that just completely became uh, worthless to God. Like you start off, you, you, mean, you mean well, you start off well, but then you just completely go downhill. So uh, this, this sermon is about uh, Solomon just kind of, laying out his life from beginning to end um, you know how he started out so I have three main points here is uh, Solomon started off as a wise man uh, then he became a spoiled man and then finally he became a vain man so three main points you know wise spoiled and then vain and it's you know uh, it's a progression it's a progression of apostasy and you, you can kind of see how um, Churches, Christians, they kind of went that same uh, same direction, unfortunately. Uh, and, uh, you, 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 can, you can see this. If you study church history, you study uh, cause and effect of why we are in the position we are now, why churches are in the condition they are now, then you will understand what I'm talking about. And uh, I think Solomon is a very good description of that. So uh, here I wrote that Solomon is a very good type of the Laodicean Christian. Now, Laodicean, I don't remember if I defined that in a previous video, but basically on um, uh, Laodicea is the seventh church in Revelation, and um, the seven churches are actually show church history in order, and we are currently in the seventh church age. Now that is uh, a topic for another video. You know, just defining the seven churches and all that. That would be a very good church history uh, video. And that, that would take several videos to, to, to cover. 
but for now, you know, I'm just going to stick to what I have here. Um, so, you know, he starts off with God's blessing. You know, Solomon asks for wisdom uh, from God because he realizes that he needs it. So that's important. Solomon realizes he needs God. Um, he gets put into position. He's very young. He's, I think he's like 17 when he becomes king. And uh, he does not feel qualified for the job. So he asks God for wisdom. Like I, I think he's 17. Maybe he, he might even be younger. Forget the, the dates. But he's very young. And he understands he needs God. So he starts off very humble. He does it. And he's not making. He's not being very uh, showy. He's not showing off. He's not being pride or arrogant. He really needs God's wisdom. He understands it. So first I would like to. Uh, let's see. Let's read from 1 Kings chapter 3. So 1 Kings chapter 3. I have here, yeah, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. So 1 Kings 3, 7 through 9. Uh, and, and now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servants an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. So yeah, a lot is said here. See, according, okay. So Solomon replaces David as king. You know, uh, David you know, passed away, Solomon is now king, and he has a lot of stuff on his plate. He has a lot of things to deal with, um, a lot of leftover problems from the previous king, and he's young, so people are going to try to take advantage of him and question his authority. Um, you know, that, that's just how it goes. I don't, I don't know why that is, but unfortunately when someone, when there's a new boss, and someone new in charge, there's always someone that tries to question authority and uh, always undermine this new person, especially if they're young. So Solomon does have a lot on his plate, and some of these people are his own brothers, which if, you, if you've read you know, those, those passages, you'd know that he had a lot of brothers, and some of them were older and maybe felt more qualified than Solomon you know, uh, did as, as king. They, they felt they deserved that title more. So he, he had some of his own brothers to deal with as well. And one of them in particular that was, was really causing some trouble. So anyway, so he has a lot to deal with. And instead of, so he, he became, he says, I'm but a little child. I know not know how, how to go out or come in. Like, I don't even know how to wage war. Go, you know, go out or come in. And so he's like, he's really, he's really humbling himself. You know, he's really humbling himself here. Um, and verse 8, And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people which cannot be mount, uh, numbered nor counted for multitude. And yeah, there were many of them. Uh, I forget the actual population at this time of Israel, but it was at least a million, if not several million. I forget the exact numbers. I know that there were uh, a lot of issues. Sometimes um, wars broke out and, you know, plagues and they lost people. And the population really had a hard time, like, you know, staying stable. But uh, David did count, and I forget the exact numbers, but it was, it was like at least a, a million. So it was, it was quite a high number. And, you know, it's a big, you know, a lot of people to, uh, to be in charge of. And give therefore thy servants an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this so great a people? It's like, yeah, who can do this? I, uh, who's qualified? I'm not, I don't feel qualified. I need you. And that's important. It's an important. Uh, it's important to have that kind of mindset with God, a, a humble spirit, and understand that you need God for everything, like every every little thing. Um, and he understood that he was in a position where he really felt uh, unqualified. And um, like, yeah, you need confidence. Confidence is important, but you, you need you need God. You need to know that God is who's going to bless you at the end of the day. Like you, you on your own, you, you can't do anything. Like so, um, if God, like, uh, not everything's in your control. A lot of things are not in your control. You can control how you react to things. You can control 
some of your actions, but some things are just way out of your control. You're just not going to be able to do anything. Uh, they're, they're in God's control. So uh, they, there's just sometimes you're just going to have to ask God to, to do it, because to do something, because it is outside your power. Like You cannot, you're not going to be able to move it. It'll be some wall, and you're not going to move that wall. So, <clears throat> to more to understand that, Solomon understood that. He, Solomon understood that he needed God. Uh, he wanted to be able to discern good and evil, make the right decisions, make righteous decisions, good decisions. Um, and this, this is basically, I think, a picture of how people get saved. You know, they come to God with a humble spirit, and they understand they need Jesus in their life. So that, that's really, that, that's how you start off with God. You do not start off with God with pride and arrogance. It just, it just doesn't work like that. You are not going to get on God's good terms by being proud and arrogant. Like, He knows who you are. He knows every thought in your head. He knows what you're made of. You're not going to impress God, so stop trying to impress God. It's just not going to work. You can impress people. You can try to you know, show off in front of people. You, you're not going to show off in front of God. You're not going to impress Him, so don't, don't even try. Um, you want to approach Him with a humble spirit. Um, so anyway, so let's continue. So that, that's my first passage. I actually have quite a lot of verses in this sermon. This will probably span, I don't know, two or three videos. Um, uh, next one, 1 Kings 4.29. Okay, so 1 Kings 4.29. We're there. Let's see, we're there already. Yeah, 1 Kings 4.29. Uh, 429 and uh, verse yeah, tw verse 29, verse 30. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. So a very important set of verses here. So... Um, so he's saying that like God gave him immense wisdom, like probably more than he even asked for. He just asked for wisdom to do his job, and God, God as always, doesn't just answer your prayer. Uh, if he really likes your prayer, he goes, you know, he goes beyond. So he made Solomon immensely intelligent, uh, wise. So we're talking not just like in a spiritual sense, like wise, discerning good and evil. Like if you if you read, you know, some of his wisdom, uh, you could see that. But also, like, just an, as an IQ, I, I think in an IQ terms as well, as well, you know, just a very intelligent person. And if you read, you know, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, you can kind of see that. Um, uh, you know, like, uh, that, that's another way to really peer into Solomon's mind is Proverbs and then Ecclesiastes. And seeing the contrast between the two, you can kind of see it, you know. Proverbs, I'm guessing, was written when he was doing right for the most part. And Ecclesiastes, that's like near the end of his life, and you could see all the apostasy and, uh, like, the life he's lived. You can see how it's influenced him in, in, uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, so, God made Solomon incredibly wise. Uh, and then, finally, in scene, verse 30, it says, "...in his wisdom excel the wisdom of all the children of the East Country, and all the wisdom of Egypt." So, there were a lot of other wise men in these other countries, you know, that were apparently knew something, uh, scholars possibly, philosophers, and Solomon was wiser than all of them. And yeah, I definitely believe that. And if you read the Bible, you can definitely see that, uh, that wisdom. You know, like, uh, the, the world likes to praise these, like, Greek philosophers and all of this, like, uh, and then, like, later in the Renaissance, they had all these French philosophers, and then you had German philosophers, like, yeah, these you know these atheists that started popping up like you know because of the Renaissance, and they had these you know wise ideas supposedly. Um, you know before all of that, you know Solomon lived in a thousand BC, so we're talking like three thousand years ago, and Solomon was already saying some pretty intelligent, very deep stuff uh, in the Bible. It's written down uh, three thousand years ago. And that was before the Greek philosophers or any of these other people. He came before all of them. And they didn't really say anything new, to be honest. Uh, Solomon already said everything they said in, in simpler terms. Um, they pretty much just kind of talked about, like, uh, uh, 
the vanity of life and humanitarian. No, no, they, they, they tried to make sense of life. And when you don't believe in God, like, what kind of sense are you going to come come up with? You know, uh, you're not going to come up with anything. Um, you're going to just, you're going to come up, you're going to, if you're going to be, uh, you're just going to come up with, well, everything's meaningless because there's no God. I'm going to die one day. I'm going to be in the grave. So everything just doesn't make any sense. Whatever. It, it's not important. Everything is vanity. So that, that that's the condition you get to is if you're not close to the Lord and you don't believe in God. And interestingly enough, in Ecclesiastes, you literally see Solomon with the same exact chain of thought. Like he literally says the same exact things these atheists were saying. Like everything's vanity, everything's pointless because he got away from God. He was saved, believed in God, and he got away from God, and that's why he ended up like that, where everything's pointless and meaningless. That's what happens when you when you when you get away from God. And so it, what's interesting is he really was that wise, and none of these Greek philosophers really added to anything they did to what he said. And in you know, if you take uh, any of these philosophy classes, these psychology classes in college, they're not going to talk about Solomon. I don't remember them talking about Solomon. They're going to talk about these Greek philosophers. They're going to talk about Socrates and Plato and Voltaire and all these other guys, but they will not mention Solomon, even though Solomon said pretty much everything they said way before they ever said it. Um, and he knew God, unlike unlike them. Um, so he had that's the you know he was the real philosopher. Solomon was the real philosopher, uh, and he he said some pretty wise stuff before all these guys did. And then and, and then even before Solomon, he had Job. Job or Job was already kind of uh, pondering a lot of these things as well, a lot of these deep thoughts. Um, and back then, they actually believed in God. They actually had a connection with God because this was only. Uh, you know, when Job wrote, this was like 1700 BC, so it was actually the first, uh, the oldest book in the Bible is Job. Uh, he lived probably, this was before Moses wrote, you know, the five books, of the, the first five books of the Bible. So this was like 1700 BC. I think it might have been, maybe even earlier, maybe even Abraham's time, which was 1900 BC. So it, it might have even been back then, around the time of Abraham, maybe a little farther than that. So. He was only a few hundred years removed from like Noah and the Ark. Like he was, um, he was pretty. He was not that far removed from the truth, you know. And Abraham wasn't that far removed from the truth, and that's why a lot of cultures at that time had a story of a worldwide flood. There's actually stories in different cultures around the same time talking about a worldwide flood. Now some of the details got mixed up. They're they're not necessarily saying the same things, but. Um, there is a story of a worldwide flood in many, many cultures around that, that time, that time frame. So it's a very, very interesting fact. Um, so, you know, he, so Job wasn't that far removed, so he, he had a connection with God. And, you know, Solomon obviously knew the real God, so when they talk philosophy, it, it makes sense, you know, there's, there's some, some, some grain of truth to it. When you remove God from it, then you're just like, what's the point then? Just go die and, and you're going to be in the grave, whatever. Everything's meaningless, right? So, um, so anyway, yeah, Solomon definitely does not get enough credit in uh, in the history books, obviously, as a, as a great philosopher, uh, because they're obviously not going to give credit to someone in the Bible, right? Like, why would they? They're going to pick some heathen, Socrates or Plato, and you know, read about their lives, read what kind of people they were. So, um, anyway. So, yeah, so he's, you know, so, so before, all, before all those guys, he, he had Solomon, he had Solomon, before all those guys. Okay, so, um, so yeah, Solomon just had this wisdom, you know, this wisdom. And then, so let, let's, let's read one more verse here, 429, 430. Um, so he had all this wisdom, this knowledge, you know, so that's kind of, that's kind of like what we have here, right? We have wisdom and knowledge. We live in a day, in the day and age of like computers, technology, all this wisdom, and we have it at our fingertips. We're, we're blessed with all this knowledge, you know, uh, that, you know, that people didn't have before. We have all this, we have attained this knowledge. And you would think we'd be happier, or make wiser decisions, but that's not always the case. And Solomon's life it actually shows that having high levels of wisdom and intelligence isn't necessarily going to make you happier or make good decisions in the long run because when you don't have God none of that matters when you stay away when you get away from God your intelligence whatever 
it's gonna it's not gonna work you're just gonna you're gonna make bad decisions you're gonna just go go crazy like that's what happens people go crazy Solomon went crazy he made some really bad decisions like stupid decisions and you you'll just be amazed like this is the smartest guy ever right yeah he made dumb decisions so if the smartest guy ever makes dumb decisions then just what about the rest of us what kind of dumb decisions are we gonna make so just just think about that think about what happens when you when you get away from God you're gonna make dumb decisions um, so yeah, let's read, let's see, what do I have here? Um, yeah, so let's read 1st Kings, 1st Kings 10, 21. Yeah, 1st Kings chapter 10, verse 21. So this is like, this is chronologically showing parts of Solomon's life. 1st Kings 10, 21, chapter 10, verse 21. And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. So that's just describing how rich Solomon was, like literally ostentatious, like, oh, silver, it's whatever, who cares, you know, like, well, it doesn't matter. So, so luxurious, like he literally was the richest king in Israel's history. And the, Solomon's kingdom was, like, that was the peak. Like, on the out, you know, we're not talking about spiritually, but on the outside, they look, they were the wealthiest. You know, they didn't have wars to deal with. They were in peace. Everything was cool. And, you know, this is where they're starting to get spoiled. This is actually going to start going into my second point. Um, and this, I think, is a very good description of the American Christian, um, where you do have, so many resources, you're so rich, so, so many goods, you know, and that sort of talks about in the book of Revelations, like, um, you, you feel like you're, like, I'm summarizing now, um, like, you, you think you're rich, but you're not, you know, you're, you're naked and you're poor, um, and that's really the condition of the American Christian, it's like, we, it's like, we're rich, but no, internally, inside, you're poor and naked, you, you have no spiritual backbone, you have no spiritual hardly any spiritual growth it's it's all it's all a facade it's all it's all outward show uh trying to keep up with your neighbors trying to fit in with the crowd so this it, that's all it is it's just it's accumulation of mammon and wealth and you can be rich and be godly but um it's kind of tough you know because it's just going to be a distraction it's gonna be a weight it's gonna be a weight it's gonna be a burden. It's gonna drag you down. That's what uh, to, to uh, being too wealthy. That's what it's gonna do to you. And that, that's that's what started to happen to Solomon. That's what started to happen to Solomon. He got uh, it became too peaceful, you know. Uh, in times of war, you're on your toes and you're you're more disciplined. But in times of peace, uh, people get lazy and in comfort, and it causes a decay of morality. And um, What's interesting is, like, if you read in history, this is actually not the first time. It actually, history goes in cycles, actually. This is a very interesting thing to read up on. But, yes, history does go in cycles. And you'll, you'll start to have, like, you know, the disciplined. Then you'll start getting, like, a more uh, weak, spoiled culture. And every generation, it just goes. And it's like every few, like, I don't know if it happens, like, every 100 years or 80 years. There's been some theories on it. But, basically, it's a, it's a cycle about the seasons, the rise and the fall of countries. Uh, it's actually a giant, you know, some people have these theories in history, actually, about how this has happened in the past. And so right now, I would definitely say we are in that lazy, peaceful time. I would definitely say that. And it seems like there's stuff on the horizon that's, that's changing that, you know? First we get COVID, then we have this war between Ukraine and Russia. And I, I mean, I don't know what's on God's mind. I think God's definitely doing something right now. Uh, that it's gonna it's disrupting us it's disrupting the world uh right now so uh you know it's disrupting our peace we've had a peace for so long right you know like uh last time america had like a big war was like Viet vietnam it's been so long and a lot of countries like since world war ii it's like we've been we've been, pr pr we've been pretty fine right since world war ii and um we've been in peace and then uh christians have all this freedom right and uh, that's the problem. We have a lot of freedom. We have a lot of peace. We can do whatever we want. And uh, it spoiled us. It spoiled um, basically our, you know, our world. It's uh, spoiled the next generation. You know, one generation of Christians has discipline. 
Um, the next generation of Christians ends up being a little spoiled. They're still saved, but spoiled. And then the next generation of Christians usually end, just, end up being complete heathen that don't even want to go to church. And this is really what's starting to happen now is that um, Christians can't even get their children to go to church anymore. And this is becoming a problem. And uh, with a lot of the, you know, the push from the so, you know, social media and the, the culture, um, it's become very anti-church or, or like go to the liberal church, the nice church, right? Um, anyway, there, there's, there's a big push for that. And it's, uh, it's a big pressure and people want to fit in. So there, um, people have uh, given in basically. You know, instead of instead of holding to the Bible and to tradition and to some kind of standard, they have given in and to try to blend in with the world, to try to fit in. Peer pressure, basically. That's basically what happened to Christians. They just gave into peer pressure, and it's been happening for a long time. So uh, before, I, yeah, I, I guess I'm still on topic technically. Uh, but um, yeah, peer pressure is what killed killed the church for probably the last. I'd say slightly. It's basically it's uh, it's probably been over 100 years actually. Like I, I mean, this is probably a, a, another topic for another day. But it's probably been since about the 1880s. You could probably say that's when it started happening. The, the apostasy. It was slow at first, but then it started kind of rolling downhill. And in in the 60s, I'd say really really picked up in the 60s. That's when a lot of this. Uh, decay, moral decay, actually started happening. So, anyway, so that was just a, that was just like a, a slight church history lesson on the side here. But uh, Solomon, I think, is just a very good picture. He's a very good type of the modern Christian. I think he really symbolizes the modern Christian very well. Uh, Solomon, you know, filled with wisdom and talent, and just not using it correctly, like just. Starting off well, meaning well, and just completely just going downhill. Um, so Solomon just kind of represents man at their best. Like, you're born into the best conditions. You have wealth, you have intelligence, you have talent, you have passion and drive, and you end up as a mess at the end of your life. Like, how is that possible? That's what happens to a celebrity. Solomon's like a celebrity, basically. Like... Like what happens when you have all that freedom? Uh, like you're not like nobody's stopping you. You have freedom to do these things. You have you have the wealth and the time to do things, and you have possibilities that most people don't. You're able to do things most people can't do, and it spoils you and ruins you. And that is what happened to Solomon. That is what happened to a lot of celebrities, a lot of famous people in general. Uh, they just get depressed at the end of their lives. And logically, they should be the happiest, right? Logically. Let's just think about it like, logically. You have the most, most resources. You have the, the most stuff. The most stuff, and you're intelligent. And you're probably handsome, too. Solomon was probably handsome. I don't know. I'm guessing. Um, so, you know, and if you have everything, everything's handed to you. God just, like, you, you, win, the, you win the genetic lottery. You win the, the money lottery. Uh, you win the talent lottery, you, you win all the lotteries, and you're still a miserable wreck. And that happens, that happens, that, that's man, because because uh, of sin, that's the psychology of man. It's just never enough. You're going to want more, you're going to get depressed. And that, that's what Ecclesiastes really talks about. I think so, that's why I think Ecclesiastes is a brilliant book of the Bible, actually. It really talks about, like, uh, man in their like miserable messy condition despite everything looking good on the outside every the outside's all good you're still a mess on the inside and that that that's well, that's what happened to solomon so he has everything a man could desire and he's still just messes messed it all up um so yeah he, like he had everything unsafe people want just all all the stuff and it just it, it didn't make him happy he had everything everybody could uh, anyone could want so that, that's my first point is that he started off as a wise man and then he became spoiled he became spoiled he became ruined uh, he wanted you know more and that, that, that's what happens to everybody this, this is the logical progression of what happens when you get uh, blessed abundantly and you don't know how to restrain yourself or handle handle it you, can, you don't know how to ha properly handle blessings from God 
you need to there, there that's that's that, that takes wisdom to properly handle blessings to correctly take them from god and for them to not ruin you so that's my first point uh so i think i'll yeah i'll end the sermon here um yeah this part uh the next video i'll be talking about how solomon became a spoiled man and just kind of go more into detail of how you know how exactly um he became you know I'll talk more about how he became a spoiled man and then finally how he became a vain man talk about him in a near, near the end of his life so that might be like we might get like a second or third video out of this so yeah i'll see you next time for the next video